Hello, and welcome to the Craft Brewed Music Podcast, the official podcast of Craft Brewed Music, the app that streams better music for serious listeners. Here we explore and get to know the creators of that music. I'm Brian Horner, founder and curator of Craft Brewed Music, and I'm joined by my friend and co-host Aaron Stamen, a Craft Brewed Music artist. So that was all one artist, a few of the many worlds of Helen Gillet. As you can hear, she's many things, and even by craft brewed music standards, she's diverse. Helen has a new album coming out this week with the three-time Grammy-winning saxophonist Jeff Coffin, which we'll talk about in a bit, but he describes her this way. She is at once deeply rooted, historical, forward-reaching, in the sky, pushing, prying, releasing, taking charge, acquiescing, leading, following, empathic, subtle, liquid. She's air and fire, earth and sky. Helen Gillet is a profoundly powerful musical spirit. We're happy to have her here with us and uh, looking forward to getting into all this. Thanks for joining us, Helen. Thank you so much. What a beautiful introduction. Hi, Helen. Hi, Aaron. I thought Jeff summed it up uh, fairly well, and it's not easy to do. He is, he is a masterful person through and through, that Jeff Coffin. Um, so for, for my experience, uh, listening to your music in depth over the last uh, couple of weeks has, has been kind of like a long weekend in, in New York where you, you take in a lot of theater uh, and you keep realizing it's the same actor you see over and over again. Uh, and you go to like, you know, the vaudeville show, you go to Shakespeare in the park, you go to the one woman show where there's this spaceship that's really a uterus. Uh, and you're like, is that her again? How could that be like this one person doing all these different things? Uh, and it's kind of mind boggling how, uh, you've managed to, uh, wear all these different costumes, uh, simultaneously. And not as, you know, typically, you know, when Brian and I uh, survey the work of artists, there's kind of seasons of the musician and different periods they go through. But you seem to be experiencing all these different genres, all these different stylistic twists 
simultaneously at one point in your career? Well, oh, thank you for that beautiful description. Yeah, I um, I think the deepening of experience or the widening of my scope just started so early for me. I was so blessed with um, with a, a already a, a bicultural parental team of a Belgian father and American mother from Chicago, and a mother who was rearing to go with a global existence and um, a Belgian father who was the same way. And I ended up being raised in three continents. Uh, I, w- I was raised in Belgium and then I lived in Singapore for nine years as a girl, a little girl, two to 11 years old. And every summer we'd go back to Belgium and I'd go into like farm world and hiking and making blueberry jam and the cheese wheels of my great grandparents aunt and uncle shop in rural Belgium, uh, herb cheese, which you never forget once you've smelled it once. Um, and then going to Chicago and Mr. Rogers and ice cream cones and roller blades and hyper color shirts and American, um, life, you know, full of the commercial, um, you know, commercial, um, you know, all the toys and all the, um, you know, I don't know, just America, you know, it's this incredibly big entity when you're from a small town in Belgium, but then going back to Singapore and being around, you know, there were monkeys that snuck into my French, French school classroom that was in the jungle of Singapore. I mean, so, and all that was happening simultaneously for me. And all of that was normal for me. And so I always, I never thought that was abnormal. I just thought that was normal. So, uh, yeah. Were you, so was the, the process of kind of imbibing all of the, uh, the, 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 the cultural riches of these different environments, was that kind of a passive process? You're just there and you're a kid and your imagination's on fire or was there, was there a conscious and active delving into the, to the, like the musical, uh, uh, cultures of those places? Um, music was always part of my family. My mom played the clarinet with Singapore Symphony and different um, uh, community orchestras. And and then my father always played piano and he had a, a baritone tuba, you know, a, a euphonium um, that he would, you know, play the, the theme to the Pink Panther at our pool parties that I would have in Singapore because it's pretty hot <laughs> there. So there's a lot of pool parties. Um, and, you know, I had like a very uh, entertaining, improvisatory father in the musical sense and a very studious clarinet and piano playing mother who would read her classical things. And so it, I was always around the household and um, so, yeah, I would hear, you know, there was those old Toyota pickup trucks on the highways in Singapore every February around Chinese New Year. Um, I remember we would inevitably pass a few of them and the, the whole, you know, lion dance or dragon dance band was uh, clanging the cymbals and banging on the drums down the highway. You know, no one's wearing a seatbelt. This is this is the 80s in, in Singapore. So <laughs> there was a uh, it was a different time. But um, it uh that was in my ears and French medieval Belgian folk songs at summer camp were in my ears. And then, and, um, and then like really, really amazingly awful and beautiful Muzak at the shopping malls in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was, I was t- kind of a decade behind everybody in America uh, while I was in those countries musically. And then I'd get to the States and, People would be name dropping stuff. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but <laughs> but it just, uh, yeah. A whole, and then I, But then I was a classical stu- student on the cello. So I kind of channeled my musical education uh, in classical music as far as studying an instrument um, from age nine until 19, basically. Um, and I didn't realize that I could... I could merge my music life with my um, more eclectic uh, life experience until I was uh, until I learned how to learn about improvised music and then jazz. And that's when did, what, that, when did that happen? That was at 19. Um, I a uh, big, big shout out to my first improv teacher, my guru. Um, she's an Indian classical cello player. Her name's Nancy Lesh. And she, uh, Ellie, like, like Phil Lesh, but no relation. Um, 
and she gave up her classical career. She was in the Rome Festival Orchestra and she went to India for seven years um, to study with an Indian, North Indian Hindustani male vocalist. And he, she really uh, is unique in the world. She adapted his style of singing to cello playing. She gave up classical, Western classical and sat on the cross-legged on the ground, welded a T-bar to hold her cello in place, put a sitar string on the cello and studied intensively um, uh, in that in the genre of North Indian classical music. And she's still doing it to this day. And I was lucky enough that she happened to live in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, she raised her kids there, uh, half there and half in India for a decade. And I happened to coincide with that um, while I was in college. And I, uh, I studied with her for two years and she taught me how to improvise just in, in the genre of Indian music. But that was the, the gateway into jazz for me because I, my ears were kind of, my ears were slacking a little bit in the classical world. I mean, I hate to admit it, but they were, they were very focused on the analytical, uh, perfectionistic, you know, detail oriented classical education, but they were pretty lazy as far as really hearing and listening to what's going on around me until mm -hmm. I started studying Indian music. That was my path. And so did she put that in front of you as far as improvisation and all of that? Or did you start to study with her and then have this realization that your life to date could could be manifested through your music? She, my first lesson with her, she, her cello was in the shop and she just sang to me and asked me to play what I was hearing. And I couldn't find the first note on the cello. And it something went off in my mind, like, how am I playing a Rachmaninoff sonata by heart? but I can't even find one note out of thin air when someone sings it to me. And so I felt like a little baby in a whole other universe, like a paradigm shift in music. And so I continued studying with her, but she didn't say, well, now you can be a jazz musician too. And she was very intensely focused on teaching me Indian music, but it was the, it was the, the fact that, the way she taught me was purely improvisatory without, there was some reading notation, but it was mainly um, to remember these really long, complicated Indian compositions. We were looking at stuff, but it wasn't reading in the same way. It changed the way my mind translates uh, sonic knowledge into physical movement on the cello. And that made me curious about jazz. And then I went to Velvet, the Velvet Lounge in South Chicago, Fred Anderson's club near Chinatown. And um, I think it's 89 and a half South Indiana Street. I'll never forget because it was a tiny place. And my mom snuck, us, snuck me in because I was underage. And I heard a, I saw a sitar player playing with a big jazz group on a Sunday night jam. And I thought, if a sitar player can do it, so can I. And on the cello, because I hadn't heard a, another jazz cellist at that point. And then soon after that, I, I was like, jazz cello, let me go ask the Chicago Jazz Mart. And sure enough, I I got like assaulted with a million different cello players, like Abdul Wadu, Julius Hemphill Orchestra, and um, and of course, Eric Friedlander from New York. And I mean, nowadays, there's so many, but even back then, it was still kind of a, you know, a 40 person sort of <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Club. And that, that first track on uh, on Helkiaz is uh, sounds like a, a bit of a nod to your uh, your first imp improvisation uh, mentor. Absolutely, that is a um, a reference to a rag called bihag, which is an evening rag supposed to be played between the hours of uh, eight and ten p.m. <laughs> and do you have one of the one of like a cello in that style with like the the drone string on it that we're hearing there? Or is that something else that we're hearing on the recording? Um, that is uh, something else. That is a, uh, a Shruti box that I bought in Pune, India, when I went to visit uh, Nancy just a few years ago. Um, and I, I, I bought, it's a, you know, it's an electronic tempura. So it, it's imitating mm -hmm. the uh, tempura. So I have that going um, in the background.
And so from, you know, the realization that you could get into jazz that kept, you know, kept finding forks in the road, it sounds like, and taking them. <laughs> um, so walk us through that. How did, how did that uh, continue to unfold? Well, I found the awesome club that is the New Directions Cello Society. <laughs> um, it's a group of cellists in all different genres who get together and um, once a year. It was founded by Chris White. Um, and and it, it brings keynote cello player, you know, um, to do master class and, and te- teach uh, teach everybody what they were doing. And I met a whole I met Eric Friedlander and then uh, I got wind of Vincent Courtois, who's an incredible French cello player who I still to this day think is one of my big uh, inspirations, um, in addition to Abdul Wadud. And then Ernst Reisiger was one of the uh, people there who was uh, the cellist who was leading a big orchestra and then, you know, played a solo and uh, show. And and then he coached our string quartet or we would get out into these cello quartets and um, break out in these smaller groups and work on stuff. And he his music was so inspiring to me, his way of playing, his freedom, his uh, sense of humor. And uh, he was one of my big inspirations. I really enjoyed his playing. And I found out the the whole ICP orchestra in Holland and in, in Amsterdam, Rotterdam, the scene over there of this European jazz has a sense of humor that spoke to me. And I think I am European in part. And I think the part of me that has a dry sense of humor sort of latched onto that as a way of letting loose. It reminded me of maybe my my father's improvisatory sense and, and wordplay and sense of humor and sort of this other type of jazz that bridged the gap between American jazz and European jazz for me, I think was really influential as well. So, I mean, I was just at that, at that age, I was just collecting albums to listen to collecting things. And I just immersed myself and got more and more into it. And then I moved to new Orleans um, because I felt like the scene here was very open to someone who's a beginner in jazz. And also I knew there was a lot of great players here and it was a very good move because I knew that I was very excited about this type of music, but I was not really great yet at playing it, but I really wanted to. So I came here and I started working with people and, you know, because it's a cello and there weren't any other cellists um, at the time, that's kind of my path. And I, yeah. And New Orleans, I mean, I could, I could go on and on about all the amazing people that I got to work with here uh, in New Orleans uh, being my teachers. New Orleans, I mean, it, it seems like the logical place for you to land if you if you choose to spend most of your time in the United States as arguably our, our most European city for sure, but yeah. also a place w- which is, you know, all, all forms of uh, the American music form known as jazz uh, seems to flourish there. In particular, um, the, the, the kind of the European version uh, of that as well. There's There's definitely a what is referred to as the, the gypsy jazz uh, phenomenon, the Django Reinhardt aficionados, uh, and that kind of you know early uh, 20th century uh, Parisian uh, sound of jazz seems to flourish in uh, in New Orleans. Yes, absolutely, very well well said. Um, I don't I don't think I actually um, I, I could have I didn't predict that aspect. Uh, also cradling my uh, nostalgic, you know, um, in, um, what is it? My my roots, I guess, of, of the French chansons that I grew up listening to because my father is a big Georges Brassens fan who's, mm-hmm. you know, prolific. I, I call him like the Leonard Cohen of Southern France in the 1940s and 50s. You know, he just wrote a ton of songs and they're very witty and poetic and... Um, I just I didn't realize that that also was going to find its find some support and a place and a, a, a stage. That Even wasn't though something it, you you weren't seeking that out when you went no. to New Orleans. Like, oh, this is a way I can blend my love of improvisatory music and my love of you know French, French culture. And... No, not at all. It's funny. I, I spent the th- I I just really wanted to like play jazz. I wanted to I wanted to improvise in that free free way that would allow me to go. To, that would that would translate, um, I think, all of my life experience into a form of music that feels like home, and that kind of Im- 
improvised freedom, uh, you know, a very deep listening and reacting and interacting in the community and camaraderie of really interacting with people in a totally free way. Um, and the music would go everywhere. It can get very pretty and meditative, and but it can also get groovy, especially here in New Orleans, it can get really funky. I'm a huge Prince fan. That that felt good. Mm -hmm. um, but it also it also could get very dark and very um, chaotic and nightmarish, and and it just felt honest. It feels like an honest way of. But and so playing in that way served as a bridge to to songwriting. The chansons, the singing and playing cello only really started happening. Um, after about three years of living here and finding my freedom in, in improvising and wanting to sing and play at the same time, which, which came out of Katrina, actually, because I lost my bands. <laughs> and I, for a while, I was, I was on my own living in a school bus in the woods of Texas. It's a long story, but anyway, and I, I had just my cello and I, and some and friends around and I wanted to play, but I wanted at least two voices. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I taught myself to sing and play and, and the stuff that resonated with me were these French songs. So I, um, for a while, I, my arm was stuck in a waltz pattern, a three, four pattern <laughs> with singing and playing. I couldn't sing and play in four, four because all of the French <laughs> songs were in three, four. <laughs> so, huh. So was that was that typical for someone growing up in in, in that part of, uh, of Belgium uh, to ha have music of that era in the house? Because this is when we talk about uh, Georges Brasset, that's somebody who was born in the twenties, probably became popular around the World War II era. So it's more of your grandparents' generation of music. Are those things that are still popular? They're still alive in households as a as a song form. It's funny, my my cousins who all make fun of me for. They're like, you're singing all that old stuff, you know, because like mm -hmm. Belgium's known for its electronic, like, you know, house, you know, new wave, it's, you know, like the mu electronic music took off in the 90s. I'm supposed to be into that. All my, my cousins are make, are very musical and they're doing like digital. They were doing digital music in the 90s. But here I am getting into French chansons. I think it's because my parents listened to that. And I'm, my mom, my American mother learning French I think she and she was also very she's very literary and intelligent and uh, she was a theologian and she had four master's degrees so wow, but wow. She, she yeah so she she got really into Georges Brassens because he was a Latin and French professor and his French was very witty and nuanced and poetic and so the language the um, clever language and the beauty in, in crafting his songs was something she was really into. And my dad listened to it because his, it was his parents' generation. And so I was a little girl listening to that around the house. Jacques Cupidon, sa propre flèche. Tant d'amour l'ont essayé, qui de leur bonheur ont payé ce sacrilège. J'ai l'honneur de ne pas te demander ta main. Ne gravons pas, non, non, voilà par chemin. Laissons le champ libre à l'oiseau, nous serons tout, tout, tous les deux prisonniers. Sur parole, au diable les maîtresses que qui attachent les cœurs au cœur. Dans le pot au feu, là, la, la marguerite. 
so I, I guess I'm the, I'm the, the person in, in, in the younger generation of our family that, that uh, latched on to the older style of music. Also, I think being removed from Belgium, you know, I moved to the States when I was 13, when my, my parents split up and I ended up in Chicago. And I think I also, I'll admit to the nostalgia, hanging on to some of that nostalgia, I think, um, on, a, on a psychological, uh, you know, front, I'm sure there was some yeah. just nostalgia mm-hmm. there for me to keep that alive in me. One of the questions that, that occurred to me, um, you know, as I listened to that, uh, your um your homages to these uh, these French songwriters. Um, does that um, sense of having things that are uh, lyric driven, that are uh, that are uh, intellectual and witty, um, does, does does that affect your sensibilities when you write songs in English? Uh, to have that same kind of paramount importance of the the lyrics driving everything. <laughs> That's such a great question. I and I, my my mother who's um, been been gone for six years now would, is smiling down on that question. Um, I I do not feel like I could ever really compete with that level of intellectual um, lyrical genius, but I do. It does influence me, and I think the poetry. Uh, that I was lucky enough to be exposed to in the French language influences the way I write in English, definitely. Um, I don't know if I could ever compete with with the wordplay and the the lyrical prowess of Georges Brassens, but um, I uh, I do I do have a I think the Belgium's sort of known for its surrealist philosoph- philosophy and art and. Uh, comic strips are huge in the part of Belgium that I was, uh, that I'm from, or my, my dad was born in and my family's from. And I think my, I have a very surrealist mind and I, I draw parallels, uh, you know, through imagery. And um, anyway, I, I think I, I think I bring that into my songwriting. Honestly, I, I, I think I'm too close to it to fully answer that question. <laughs> well, but. well oh, an exa- example of that, I mean, both Brian and I love this song and are perplexed by it because the lyrics are so surreal is uh, Alvar. Ah, yes. Uh, which which we, we uh, you know, we, we speculate, we think we know what's going on, but we really, we really don't. And it's, it's such a, a great collection of images uh, as, the, as the lyrics progress through the song. So what is actually going on? <laughs> oh, <right>. <laughs> well, um, I will say that Alvar is um, the name of a street here in New Orleans, and um, it was the street that my, actually, it's a good segue into Running of the Bells. Um, my first jazz album here was with a trio with Tim Green on saxophone and Doug Garrison on drums, and Tim was a good friend, and he was an incredible person. He started radio for the blind, and uh, in New Orleans, and he was managing WWZ, our radio station down here for a long time. Uh, he toured with Peter Gabriel and Stevie Nicks and Cool in the Gang and super unsung hero. I mean, he, he people are singing about him, but just not not as many as, as um, I would have hoped. But he is an incredible person and wonderful musician and very much my teacher. Um, and he uh, he also passed away few years after this album came out, which was a big tragedy mm. for, for New Orleans and myself and Doug. But he lived on Alvar Street, and uh, I wrote this song for him. And I looked up what the word Alvar meant to see if it meant anything. So I didn't, it's such an interesting word, Alvar. Um, and it's it's actually a, 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 a you know, ge- geological or in biological phenomenon, uh, ecosystem of of a sort of a limestone plain um and there's very very little soils for vegetation to latch onto and uh, because of that it gets flooded um and um and it just kind of reminded me of a lot of of a lot of you know tumultuous things that i've experienced in my life and losing tim and and the katrina flood and tying that into new orleans and you know i let my brain go in this circular uh, I guess a cir- circular spelunking mission of emotion and and imagery when I'm writing. Um, 
and even right now describing that I don't I'm just letting myself improvise <laughs> but I think I think that I think that um I needed to put the emotions that I felt about losing Tim into a song and I let myself um research the intellectual I mean many many people that list are listening can probably relate to this is you know to try to find your path through grief or, or emotions that are complicated. It's uh, it's nice to have a guide. And because of the way I was raised, my guide is often an intellectual. Um, uh, I, I launch myself through it uh, by, by uh, finding the, you know, intellectual diving board or, and I, I, um, and so I, yeah, I let myself explore Alvar and uh, the allegory that is Tim and what a limestone, this limestone plain that gets, you know, flooded in the spring. Um, and then Tim Green, his last name is Green. And I was thinking about uh, vegetation, uh, the, the rare, rare gem that he was as a human being. He really, truly was a special person and that he was able to, to grow despite the odds. And, and uh, you know, so that's what that song's about. It's for Tim Green. Did Great. the music of John Coltrane come into that relationship with Tim? And is that a absolutely. part of it or is that yeah. coincidental? No, no, that is absolutely true. Um, I don't know if I, if I would have said, oh, I want to, I want to make an album with Tim Green because he reminds me of John Coltrane, but it, I think it was, um, it was actually after his death. Um, I was, I was gifted a, he loved John Coltrane. I don't think I realized to what extent until his estate had so many, he, he collected paintings and photographs of John Coltrane. And um, when his sister came to help with the estate, I was gifted several items with John Coltrane on him, including a giant painting. Um, and that is hanging in my, my house now. And um, Watching you rehearse and grow old. Yeah, I think yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> To saints and sinners he said no He went riding on that train of coal Joy of life infused his art Tim's melodies were off the chart take a quick intermission for a word from our sponsor, which is us. Craft Brew Music is a curated streaming service. It's the app that streams better music for serious listeners. Sometimes we hear that people want to hear more of the songs we play on the podcast. If you like what you've been hearing, you need to download the app and get a free trial. We'll help you discover music off the beaten path so that you become the person your friends turn to for recommendations, and we split our income with the artists. It's $5 a month or $50 a year, less than a latte. We're the Small Batch Streaming app, available at the App Store and at Google Play. Or to hear samples and find out more about us, visit craftbrewedmusic.com. I wanted to, to, to ask uh, a bit more about uh, your, uh, your uh, Tephra Sound uh, Horizon project um, and how that came about. It sounds like there was, there was a, uh, 
a, like a house party that was the genesis of this, uh, this group. Yes. Um, Boy, I, it's going to sound like I'm talking about uh, ghosts a lot, and perhaps I am. I am in New Orleans. Um, <laughs> shout out to Anne Rice. Um, but I, I, I've had a lot of, you know, I, I, I've had a lot of loss in in the last decade of my life here in New Orleans, and my I lost my mother six years ago, and I, um, after she died, it was like you know, um, again, many people can relate to this where something big happens, you have a big loss and you think, okay, you know what? Life is short. I had that moment in my life where I realized life is precious. Life is short. Who do you want to work with? Let's go. You know, I mean, as, as outgoing as I am, I can be kind of an introvert, a little shy sometimes, even though once I get going, then I'm, I don't feel shy at all. But, um, I, Nikki Glaspie and I met, she's a drummer that I met at a, a jazz fest after party show, I think in 2011. And she just, everyone's jaw just, dro- you could hear all the jaws just dropping on the floor, you know, the sound of bone on greasy floor. And, um, <laughs> and it was, it was in a, a moment, <laughs> you know, I saw like grown men who were badass um, drummers just, you know, lose, lose themselves. Um, and I thought, what is happening? And I was playing and the, the drummers were in rotation. It was one of these late night jams that goes on for six hours and everybody's rotating. And she just killed it. And I thought, oh, and I looked back and I saw this, you know, some, this woman just playing drums. And I thought, OK, I want to work with her someday. And um, I was a little shy about contacting her. And then after my mom died, I was like, what do I have to lose? So I called her up and she was like, I've been waiting for you to call me. So anyway, she and I. You know, and she's played with like Dumpster Funk and Beyonce's all girl band. Like she's been all over the world. So I guess I was a little bit intimidated, but um, she hopefully she'll laugh if she ever hears this. Um, <laughs> but I and so I thought about starting a record label um, uh, that that encompasses my my improvised music, my jazz, my instrumental, because I've since, you know, developed my solo show with my singing. And I thought it might be nice to have a label that that kind of. Uh, is a, as a home for where I want to go in, uh, in improvised music. But at the same time, I, I thought the first project should just be a, a, uh, this band by the same name. So I, I, and I was talking to Nikki and Tefra is volcanic ash and volcano has a little bit of a feminine, uh, uh, you know, uh, metaphor, uh, poetry to it, um, or association. Um, but she, so I thought, uh, Tefra Sound would be a nice uh, name for this project. And I, I really wanted a rhythm section with Nikki and, and myself, because I, I like to think of myself as a bass player. Um, you know, Ron Carter played the cello a little bit. And uh, there are there are lots of, uh, you know, well, Mingus played the cello just when he, when he broke his hand, because it was easy, it was in his recovery. But I like to play like a bass player. I've learned um, and in addition to other instruments, but I wanted a, a, a project where I was driving it with Nikki um, and that we could be a rhythm section, whether I'm playing more acoustically or with the looper being a rhythmic entity that she and I are locking in on um, either way. So we started this project and then uh, we invite, and Brian Haas and I have been working together for a while and we have like a classical jazz improv thing that happens where we go from kind of Debussy to modern classical into jazz and I mean, not we don't actually play Debussy, but we we kind of end up sounding like that. Um, but so I, I brought him in the mix as a contrast to Nikki and I, who get really funky when we play together. And and Nikki wanted to stretch out and get her get a project that was a lot more adventurous, and and so it was good timing. And and then it grew from there. We added Rex Gregory on on the on the flute and clarinet, saxophone. Uh, wonderful Jessica Lurie, multi instrumentalist as well on the saxophone, flute. Um, Weedy Brema on the djembe and Alex Massa on the trumpet and, um, and this band was seven. And then, yeah, I grew into this house party. We recorded it and we made an album and it's called Horizon, which for me is like my first, um, my first album on this record label. And even within that album, it's, it's very varied. What's a, what's a, a, a track that's, that kind of, um, best typifies the, that, the sound of that group? Well, all the songs are named after volcanoes, um, and that's a, with this band that's going to be a theme. Um, yeah, for, for for amateur volcanologists, you will learn a lot 
from reading the liner notes of this album. If, you're, if that's if that's a, a separate interest of yours, it's very yes. <laughs> exactly. Hashtag volcano. Uh, sorry. Um, yes. Uh, well, but honestly, the the you know the Valles Caldera, I feel like, is a really good one that that has that explosive feeling, has an exploratory feeling. I, I love um, getting carried away with a theme. <laughs> so um, it's it's been interesting thinking about volcanoes erupting and then ash falling gently and then the long passage of time and the calm, peacefulness of that um, is, uh, is something that I think both things, having both things present in an improvised context is important. If it's, you know, it's just space, learning how to, I think that's a constant lesson in music for me is more and more space, more and more deepening understanding of silence and space and pauses. I like the uh, the scale that's created by having the cello be the bottom end of a uh, of a jazz ensemble, um, and I, I really the, the rhythm section work is, is is terrific on this album. And I was left uh, wanting to learn more. You mentioned Ron Carter. You mentioned Charles Mingus. Who, who are your other bass heroes from from the jazz idiom? Uh, let's see. Uh, well, you know, Abdul Wadud, uh, who played with Julius Hemfield. Um, he was a cello player and his rhythmic work was a big influence on me. I have so many bass players that I admire. Um, you know, I, I told you, I, I, I listen to Prince a lot and mm. I, and so, you know, and he's worked with some of the best, some of the best bass players in, in the funk genre. La- Larry Graham is probably one of my my heroes in the, in that, in, in Prince's world, just listening to that. Um, and then, you know, I have to give a shout out to James Singleton in New Orleans. He, he played with, um, well, he plays with Astral Project and he, he played with James Booker back in the day and Professor Longhair and all, all of these amazing New Orleans musicians. Um, and I got to work with him really early on within my first year of moving here. And he, he literally taught me how to play funky. I mean, I was playing this line of one of his charts and he was like, okay, you got to think about it. You know, don't think about it in these eighth note classical neurotic ways. <laughs> think about it in a big way on the one, you know, I was like, Oh, right. So, um, and then, you know, George Porter, new Orleans bass player, that just amazing. I mean, I have to be real and talk about my real experience here. You, you know, I would say in recordings, I, uh, Abdul Wadud and Ron Carter kind of, some heroes there's so many but let's just go yeah. there it's interesting that you you, you resisted uh, i don't know if you ever even had the urge to you know as you, as your imagination expanded into improvisation into jazz and these other genres you resisted the urge to switch instruments into something that's more idiomatic and said well i'm going to figure out how to do this on the cello and expand my vocabulary on my instrument as opposed to uh, as opposed to switching to another instrument. Yeah, no, I never, I, because there was enough jazz cello that I found super cool. I never thought to just, oh, I got to do this on the bass. 
you know, I was getting enough support with my uh, choices. James Singleton was actually looking for a cello player to complete a jazz string quartet. Uh, so it was perfect timing. I moved here, right? He had a, a violinist and viola player and he needed a cellist because he, and we, we put out an album. Anyway, so I just felt like there was a place for me with the cello. So I never questioned that choice, you know? You know, you went from being classically trained to getting an interest in improvisation. And then at some point you expanded uh, the things you can do with the cello with, you know, using uh, the body of the cello as a percussion instrument, uh, you know, doing more strumming, pizzicato. Uh, and then eventually you, you married this uh, versatility on an acoustic instrument with technology as well. And I'm wondering if that was, you know, when you get into looping and delays and things like that, was that, did you have to overcome a, a, the purest in, in, in Helen Gillet in order to do that? Or was that <laughs> not, not, a, not a great hurdle to, uh, to uh, surmount? I, I, love, I love answering the question of why the loop pedal, because it's so, it's so fun to me, the path. Um, I, the, the path that I took really came about something I said earlier about wanting more than one voice. Um, I, I used the loop pedal initially as a compositional tool at home. This is way before audio interfaces even, you know, were in, in the, in my orbit. Um, and doing it on the computer myself was like, I, for me, going to record was like saving up all of my pennies <laughs> and paying a very qualified engineer to do his job or her job very well. That that's what that meant. So, but at home I thought, Oh, if I have this loop pedal, I can just play a bass line and then play a harmony and a melody or vice versa. And I can compose something because I could hear, I'm not a good enough piano player or guitar player to have many strings going at the same time. I wasn't really even strumming all that much at that time. Um, so I was really using my bow and pizzicato single lines, very much like a classical player would think of music and creating layers and building out an idea that way. Um, and it wasn't until a few years after Katrina that my friend put on a music series over the course of three days at a club here called the Dragon's Den and invited all of these musicians he liked to uh, force them to play solo. He, he was inspired by Sartre's, Sartre's quote, um, uh, hell is other people, you know, so that's what the series was called. <laughs> And, uh, and so I, I was like, oh, I'll bring my loop pedal and see what I can do. And that was my first show with my looper. And I liked it because of the freedom of performing with just myself allowed me to go wherever I wanted to go. Although I realized how limited I was because my any looping artist knows that you really have to do it well to, to be convincing and, and um, sincere with that, you know, there's looping that happens that just feels so manufactured. And, and I, and, and your the technology is right up front, you know, and, and mm -hmm. to be an artist, a true artist or a masterful artist, you, you want to get to a point where you, you don't, the, the audience doesn't know you're using a loop pedal or forgets that you're using it, you know, mm -hmm. and just thinks yeah. about mm -hmm. the experience. I, I think a great example of this, uh, where there's, you know, you, you, you forget the technology and you just hear a very extremely tasteful building of, uh, of layers is, uh, uh, your, your song, uh, Vatur. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, which, uh, it really, it's, it starts out as this, uh, lovely, simple voice and cello melody and builds into this ensemble, uh, over the course of the, uh, uh, of the, of the track that, uh, that sounds very organic and, and you totally lose the sense of, of there being a, uh, a device, um, as a part of the mix.
Whirling Dervish of the cello is one of the the favorite name. We were talking about name calling. Yeah. That's one of my favorites. That's a good one. I, I, I do feel like with the looping that you, you know, just this idea of kind of like, you know, getting lost in a trance or lost in the, in the build and letting that build become something really special, taking you somewhere else. And I try to do that with my audience, take, take us all on a, on, on a, to a place. And, um, I'm I'm not and 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 I'm such an improviser that I I have a hard time hard time playing my songs the same way twice you know and so I'm trying and I'm always building live um, be, because of that because it's really important to me to be sincere you know, I think of of street performers just kind of getting people's attention and yeah. and and then I think of um, free improvised jazz where you're just trying to be listen to whatever's happening around you and make something of that uh, moment in time. And I'm kind of combining those ideas into my perform live performance of these songs that do have some structure, but uh, I try to keep it free and impactful. And, um, and it, it, by nature of a loop pedal, there is always a build. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the, the interesting themes I've noted in your, uh, uh, in your, your songs uh, where it's mainly voice and cello and the looper is that uh, um, how do I put this? You, like you're not afraid to to to, to make it weird. Like you'll you'll kind of <laughs> lull the listener into this like sense of like oh this is like a lovely diatonic melody with a kind of predictable structure, and then like it gets as it builds it gets more cacophonous and chaotic, and then it resolves back into the the, the tune again. That uh, Angeline's a great uh, example of that, where it it, it definitely you kind of lull them and think, oh, this is going to be a really pretty song, everybody. And then it gets weird. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> yep, that's pretty much, I mean, that's how my life has gone. You know, I started out in a little pretty little farmhouse in Belgium with cobblestone streets and things got weird, you know. It, but it's intentional. You, you like that moment of kind of defying the, the listener's expectations? Yes. Um, I think, well, it's also, it's natural, I should say. I'm being very sincere. Um, also, I, I think, again, just uh, some songs are okay if I leave them in that pretty diatonic place, but most of the meaning of life, <laughs> I feel like has to have, for me to feel sincere about it, has to have a little bit of a of weirdness or chaos or um, slightly something uncomfortable to bounce off of, to get resolved, to, yeah. to reflect upon, you know? So your comment earlier about uh, improvisation and 
staying in the moment is is an interesting um, jumping off point to talk about the new album, Let It Shine, with Jeff Coffin um, yes. coming out this Friday, like I said. And I think you're also going to be on his ITA studio streams, live stream on Friday night, the 19th, if I'm not yes, mistaken. Yes, I will. Mm-hmm. And um, so that has a very uh, through composed sound. There are solos in it, um, but clearly it's a set of, of compositions. Uh, some of, some of which you've collaborated on, some are by Jeff, some are by you. Um, was that, is that, um, you know, a little bit of a departure then for you? Yes. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a total, a, a different hat as you would say. Um, but I, uh, it's nice. It, it took me back a little bit to my, you know, cl- uh, modern classical head, um, of blending like in a chamber sense blending timbres mm-hmm. um because jeff is you know he's playing the bass flute the alto flute soprano sax uh percussion clarinet tenor sax you know he's he's all right. over the place uh, the you know the clickety clacks of the bass clarinet all those things are things i'm trying to blend with on the cello which i love to to dig into all of the cello sounds, but there is a definitely, um, after all of this time of expanding, um, my technique and, um, exploring technique on the cello and different things I can do with it. It was super fun to make this album with Jeff and to be able to, you know, uh, create a duet. Um, Jeff wrote a lot of this music. Most of the music on the album is written by him. I, I, um, I do a, a reprise of Unzen, which I mentioned earlier was inspired by Mingus with him. Sounds completely different than than um, on my other album, which I find cool. <laughs> would like to just give uh, Jeff Coffin a shout out and also um, uh, say that, uh, you know, thanks to him, I got to work with David Cinco, who mixed this album. And he, uh, he went and recorded that beautiful Bella Fleck, you know, the African sessions that Bella Fleck did. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just, you know, I mean, Throw Down Your Heart is an incredible documentary. It's inspiring to hear a banjo player, a string player uh, interacting rhythmically in, in those ways. It's very inspiring. But David Cinco is also just son, a, a sonic master of engineering. I mean, he's he, he as far as far as bowed string sound, he really got an amazing um he, he really he really polished this album up in a way that made me feel really comfortable because he's worked with Edgar Meyer and Yo-Yo Ma mm-hmm. and uh, Bella Fleck. And he was just the perfect person to mix this record. And of course, Jeff knew Jeff knew to use him. The reason Jeff Coffin and I know each other is thanks to Tim Green, who I mentioned earlier, that um, he was in. Um, we were playing together. And Jeff came to hear us and Tim introduced us. And I believe that it was on a spiritual level that it was Tim Green that brought us together. And so I just want to give that relationship and, and that moment a, uh, some weight and, and a shout out and a lot of gratitude. Jeff is one of the most, like, uh, you know, one of the deepest, most complicated, interesting musicians that that is also just uh, you know, it's, it's beauty and complexity through some sim- simplicity. And he, he makes me both feel like I'm like sweating and running the, the longest marathon of my life and trying to catch up and like make it to the finish line. And then at other times I, I just feel like the most ease and support. It, I, both of those things happen hmm. simultaneously with Jeff. Um, working with him is a, the most the most enjoyable challenge uh you know ever so it's it's really wonderful um and, and the unknown that is our duet 
Um, right. Because I have, it really truly is a good sign when you're doing a project where you, there's a lot of question marks in your mind, like, what is this? Where are we going? And yet you go f- like full throttle, you know, into it. It's uh, that's, that's cool. I, I think that's a sign that I'm, that you're moving the music in, into a place that you've never been before. Thank you for listening. Craft Brewed Music, both the podcast and the streaming service, has the mission of promoting this music and these artists. We can't do that without ears on the music. So if you like what you've heard here, we're going to ask two small favors. First, tell someone about the podcast. Secondly, go to the App Store or Google Play, download the Craft Brewed Music app, and try a free two-week trial of the streaming service. For more information, visit us at craftbrewedmusic.com. Thanks again, and see you next time.